Thanks. <laughs> you. Yeah, there it is. So uh, indeed, I would like to uh, uh, to share with you what we do at the Ocean Cleanup and how we use analytics in doing that. So I'll uh, give a bit of background who we are, what we do, and why we do it, um, for those of you who don't know. And then I'll zoom into uh, two topics that's, uh, that we're doing, um, using analytics to improve the operations and the, uh, well, the projects that we're doing and uh, that we're doing together with Analytics for a Better World. Um, so uh, starting with what our mission is, um, there's a lot of plastic uh, waste in the oceans floating around. Uh, which is not just something we don't like, but it's also doing harm. Um, there is plastics where marine life is getting entangled. There is marine life eating plastics because they're confusing it for food. Uh, in that way, it's also entering the food chain. Uh, there is about uh, 3 billion people in the world relying on fish as a source of protein, so they're quite directly impacted by this, by this problem. And there is also economic damage. The United Nations estimated a total of about 13 or 14 billion a yearly. Uh, as economic damage resulting from plastic waste in the in the oceans. So we would like to address that issue. And uh, our mission is to remove 90% of plastics floating in the oceans by 2014. Um, to do so, we have two main uh, focus areas, and that is uh, cleaning up the legacy pollution that's in the oceans. So all the plastics that have already gone into the oceans, that's what we want to clean up because that's doing the damage there, but also stopping the inflow because otherwise we would be doing that forever. And fun as it is, we also similarly as Analytics for a Better World are trying to make ourselves obsolete and put ourselves out of business by solving this problem. Um, so that's what we're trying to do on both ends. So stopping the inflow and also cleaning up what's already there because that's what's doing the damage every day. And uh, the plastics there are not going away by themselves. Um, but it starts with understanding the problem. So the Ocean Cleanup uh, as an organization was founded 10 years ago. Uh, we just celebrated the 10 year um, anniversary of the organization. Um, and by then it was known that plastics in the oceans was a big problem, but there was very little data about it and like, like real uh, usable scientific uh, proper data. There was just knowledge that there is a problem, but we didn't know how big, what kind of plastics, where it was coming from, how it behaves, etc. So that was the first thing to do uh, with very little resources by then. So in 2015, there was a uh, project that was uh, titled the Mega Expedition with the objective to get data from the area. And the area and it, in this case is the North Pacific. There's a, an area called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or the Not So Great Pacific Garbage Patch to some, uh, according to some, which is a better name, I think. Um, and by then there was a, a sailing race going from California to Hawaii. So we went there and talked to uh, to the captains of the boats, who are who were uh, well for I think quite obvious reasons not very enthusiastic to get data and to stop during the race. But the good thing was that they would also have to go back from Hawaii to California, and that was not a race. So then there were 30 sailing yachts participating together with a bigger mothership, taking a lot of samples, as you can see in the picture on the upper left there, um, collecting a lot of plastics that were sampling done with trolls about a meter wide. Uh, picking up whatever was there. And that was very thoroughly analyzed by our scientists in the lab. They uh, are very patient people. They literally counted millions of pieces of plastics, categorized them, analyzed what it was, why it was there. Um, but also one of the learnings or observations during that mission was that there were a lot of big pieces of plastics in the form of ghost nets, as they are called uh, mostly, and other big pieces as well. Uh, and they cannot be sampled in that way, because first of all, they are too big to enter the, the, uh, the trolls, so you don't catch them. Uh, but also they are very spread out, and they are big chunks of plastics, but they are spread out over the area. So what was done in 2016 was the aerial expedition, uh, because the way to cover a large area is by plane. So then this, uh, this beauty was used, the Kota, which uh, well, was also flown in, uh, in Vietnam, back in the days, but now it uh, changed its career for the better and got a lot of uh, information there and uh, well, a lot of photos, as you can see down there. And that gave us a very clear overview of what was in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And that gave us an estimate of a total plastic uh, uh, mass floating around there of about 100,000 tons, so 100 million kilos of plastics floating around in the area, um, which you can see on the map here. You can see that there is five areas in the oceans where plastics are collecting. It's called gyres, so it's an oceanographic term. 
Um, and that's where the plastics are mostly, of which the one in the North Pacific is, uh, is the biggest one. It's estimated that the other four together are about the same in plastic mass. Uh, you can also see that there is a lot of inflow coming from the rivers, uh, mostly in the Gulf of Bengal there. There you can see a lot. But there is a, um, a very sort of fundamental difference between the, those areas. And that is that in the river areas where the plastic is flowing in, a lot of plastics is going back on the beaches or sinking or disappears in another way. So there it is not persistent. But then those five gyres, it is there. The plastics are not going away because of the ocean currents and the, the conditions that are present there. The plastics sort of indefinitely remain in those areas. Um, so they both deserve a different approach. So if you analyze the plastics coming out of rivers, then you see that almost 50% of it is uh, sinking. The rest is uh, staying afloat. And from that part, the majority of the plastic is going back on the beaches. It's blown on, on the beaches mostly. Um, so a small fraction of that in the end ends up in the garbage patches. Um, but again, that's persistent. So it's still a very big problem. And that is doing damage for decades or even longer, um, as long as it's there. We also found last year by analyzing the catch that we got from the garbage patch that there is a very big contribution from fishing industry. It's about 80% of the plastics we find in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch originates from fishing activities. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind and to, to work to uh, addressing. So solving the problems, the one end is uh, uh, stopping the inflow from rivers. I'll touch upon that, but the majority of the, of the information today is about oceans. Um, but what we're doing there is uh, we developed uh, interceptors, as we called them. This is an interceptor original, uh, which is floating there. Plastics are guarded along the barrier, going up on the um, escalator there and then being dumped in dumpsters. This is a, another development that we are now uh, operating in Jamaica. It's going a bit fast, but I'll explain a bit more. So we have different solutions uh, for different types of rivers because the conditions can be very different and that requires different ways to address the problem. Uh, so you see here the deployments that we have uh, in operation at the moment, uh, or mostly in operation. There was the original interceptor. It's also gone, got a bit of pace left after that. Uh, we have a few of them in Southeast Asia. There's one in Los Angeles, as you can see over there. And then here in Jamaica, we have those uh, uh, interceptor barriers where the approach is different because the, the type of problem is very different. Those are not rivers emitting plastics, but there's in Kingston, there's uh, so-called gullies, sort of gutters going through the city to uh, get rainwater out of the city, but it's also used to get trash out of the city, unfortunately. And that we can catch with that system and then um, uh, process in a, uh, in a sustainable way. And the other one down there, number six, that's in Guatemala. That's uh, the most polluting river in the world. But there the mechanism again is different because there you have flash floods without, which are carrying mountains of plastics in one go. So we put a fence there last year, as you can see on the picture, where, well, maybe it's it's hard to see from the room, but everything behind that, all the sort of, it's almost looking like snow there, that's all plastics. That was like maybe 20 tons of plastics in one go. Um, so that we tested, didn't work. That was too much. There was scouring and we lost all the plastics in the end. That was very sad. But now we are, uh, as we speak, installing a new solution there, a floating solution, and we hope to be ready for the next season where we get the flash floods, which is coming up, and then actually catch and keep the plastics there. So on the ocean side, uh, we're having a different problem and, of course, a different approach. So what we're doing there is uh, we are towing a system um, through the, uh, the garbage patch. And the objective of that system is to sort of sweep all the plastics onto a big heap. So increase the concentration because sometimes you see pictures of plastic islands where you can almost walk on. If you look at the picture, that's not reality. That is some in some river mouse, it's like that. So that's where those pictures are coming from, but not in the ocean. The plastics there are still relatively scattered. It is a lot of plastic, 100,000 tons, um, but it is in an area like uh, three times the size of France. So that's it's still quite, quite spread out. So the objective of the system is to sweep that all together and then funnel it into that central area that you can see there, which we call the retention zone. And once that's full, we drag it on the deck of the vessels and then we empty it. And that looks like this. So uh, you can also see here in these videos that the plastics coming out of it, there's a lot of nets, there's a lot of ropes, baskets, buoys many different stuff. There's also very small fragments in between. And we target the larger stuff, but uh, we, we target down to 15 millimeters, but we also catch smaller things that are in between the nets or caught in the other uh, pieces of plastics. Um, so it's uh, 
it's a big heap of mess. There's many surprising objects as well. If you're interested, there's a video on our YouTube channel where we go through the more interesting objects. We catch uh, surprisingly many toilet seats, for instance, <laughs> and stuff. So it's, it's, it's quite a variety of stuff. Um, and once it is on the deck, what we do now is manually sort it in fibers and rigids because we process them differently, but also we want to analyze what's in there. We scan for uh, potential bycatch because we want to learn about that. We want to learn about the plastics. We want to assure that we have very limited bycatch. That's one of our highest priorities. Um, and we want to learn what we're doing and keep collecting more data on the plastics and on the area and see where we can uh, catch most plastics. The next step is to make the operations more efficient. And we're doing a number of things there uh, that relate to analytics. Um, what we are doing at the moment is making the system bigger um, because then we have we sweep a bigger area with the same vessels that we are using. So we had a system up to a few months ago of 800 meter long, which you can see in the middle. And we now have gone up to 1200 in the last month. And in the coming months, we will make it 1600, 1700 meters long. And we scale towards two and a half kilometer, kilometers during this year, uh, depending on what we measure and how the system behaves, of course. Uh, but that's the objective that we're having for this year. Um, then coming to the analytics part, um, one of the projects that we're doing with Analytics for a Better World is looking at fleet operations. So we use ships to operate the system, uh, and they have a number of tasks that they do. Uh, one, the most uh, uh, sort of straightforward one, is towing that retention system. That is where we're getting the plastics, and that is, in the end, what it's all about. So we're trying to maximize the uptime and uh, make those ships spend most of their time or as much of their time as we can on towing the system. Um, but there are some other things that have to be done. We have to extract plastics. So getting the plastics out of the system, that's, of course, also an essential part of the operation. Um, we have inspection, repair, and maintenance, something that needs to be done. The system is floating in the wave zone, so there is wear and tear, and we need to make sure that it remains intact. And then there is port calls and plastic logistics. So the plastics that have been extracted need to be brought to shore. The vessels need to visit shore every now and then to change crew, uh, to bunker, to get some fresh food on board and stuff like that. So those are the main elements of the operation. Uh, and we're doing that at the moment with two similar vessels, doing all of those steps in the operations uh, between those two. So um, all doing everything that needs to be done, but we're now also exploring the use of alternative vessels and maybe have specific vessels for specific steps in the operation. And in that sense, try to find the most optimal way of doing it, the most cost efficient way of doing this. Um, and that is something where Analytics for the World is supporting us with, with modeling that, making an integrated model of the old operations, forecasting what they, uh, the effect will be in future operations and how to deal with that. Um, so that is helping us, uh, us a lot in, uh, well, finding the most efficient way of doing that and also uh, tying in operational limitations that we have. And in the end, the objective is to do that at minimal cost, both financially, but also in terms of emissions, um, et cetera. Um, we aim at the end, at, in 2040, to have removed that 90% at the cost of uh, 10 euros a kilo on average. We are now at a expected cost of around 25 euros a kilo, so we still have a way to go. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, well, the big things where we see that there is room for improvement and uh, driving those costs down, with uh, maybe not the full factor two and a half, but at least a very big step towards that. Uh, and then the other one is uh, we are modeling what's happening out there in the ocean because we got that data set, but it's changing every day, of course. Uh, so our computational modelers have basically modeled the ocean, uh, all of it, but then nested models with a increasing uh, detail and, and accuracy for the, for the local effects. So the scale is changing from the full ocean down to really the plastic particle size and all the models in between that we have. Uh, so modeling the plastic behavior um, the effects of the cleanup on the uh, garbage patch and also how locally the plastics and the system are interacting. So there's quite a range of models. Uh, but, that, but that bottom left one showing all the, the currents and the plastic motions in the garbage patch, that ties into what Dick showed. Um, and um, the, uh, the targeting of that plastics, because the plastics indeed are not uniformly distributed through the area, but they're so-called hotspots. So there's areas within that garbage patch where there is a higher density of plastics locally. And those are the ones, of course, that we would like to target because then we get more plastic 
per sweep, if you like. And that's what we would like to achieve. So finding the optimal route through that garbage, garbage patch with those systems, that's the objective of the other study. And that relates to those hotspots, but there is also many operational limitations. So we cannot do very quick U-turns with such a big system, for instance. That takes time, so the rate of turn is limited. Uh, there's interactions between different systems. There's dependencies if we start to have vessels doing specific parts of the operation. So there's many operational limitations and, and considerations to take into account. Um, Simpler things, maybe we are operating from, from Vancouver Island at the moment. So we would like to start a deployment sort of northeast. And we also like to finish a track sort of northeast. So we have the shortest transit time between the operations and shore. So all kinds of considerations like that um, are included. Uh, but also the uncertainty in data, because we are modeling the garbage patch and the plastics and the hotspots. But that's not hard data, right? There's uncertainty in that. So that's a very important thing to do. Here it is again. Um, we have seen the, this beautiful thing. I also like looking at it. That's, uh, it's fascinating. You see indeed that, that the redder it is or the lighter it is, um, there's the higher density of plastics. But an interesting thing is that if you look at it, it's not necessarily going for the closest high density. It's looking farther ahead, right? So if you can see, it's planning for seven days ahead. So it's maximizing the catch over those seven days and not necessarily going for the first um, sort of uh, uh, nearest area of high density, because then after that, you may encounter a lot of low density. It's a bit like that challenge where they have kids not eat a marshmallow because then they can get a second one. That's sort of what this is doing uh, analytically, maybe. Um, so that's very interesting. And it's also including all those operational considerations. So you see that it cannot do very quick back and forth U-turns uh, uh, because that's uh, something that just the ships physically cannot do. Um, so with that, we can also drive those costs down. That's in the end the objective. Uh, and here for this study, we sort of quantify that in encounter density. So what's the average density of plastics that we see with the system? Uh, we have a benchmark case there on the left. Uh, and here we have the results of the optimization studies done so far, where uh, we got quite impressive results. Where the best one is about uh, 1.5 times higher encounter density. So basically, almost driving our cost down with a factor of 1.5, which is quite an achievement. Uh, we're now in the next step looking into uh, more refinement in the uncertainty of the data. Um, so how that impacts the results, so it may change a little bit. Um, but it's quite promising and very interesting what's been done so far. So summarizing the, uh, the two studies using analytics on how to most efficiently use a fleet of vessels, what kind of vessels to use, what cost that would be, and also uh, uh, optimizing the trajectory or the steering strategy, as we call it, um, that's helping us forward in driving costs down and more efficiently remove uh, plastics from the ocean. And in that way, we hope to end up with a uh, almost completely clean ocean in 2040. Thank you. Do we have room for discussion? Yeah, questions? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, if you want. Yeah. Well, if you want. It depends if there's questions or if you would like to. Yeah, go ahead. So it's a bit of out of scope of this great solution, but uh, why, why uh, are there manned uh, v, um, vessels, uh, vessels uh, used and not unmanned? Uh, solutions yeah well we th there's a, a couple of reasons for that when we uh, we started out developing a completely passive free floating system um that didn't really work out for a couple of reasons but one was that also needs vessels to uh support those systems right and in the end we needed so many support vessels that we could have well just tow it then the next step indeed was we want we looked at unmanned vessels um but there are a couple of problems. Uh, the, uh, getting the plastics out still requires manpower because that's very hard to automate. Um, but also more practical stuff, like if you have unmanned vessels, then uh, you need to power them through diesel because battery technology is not there yet. The energy density is just not enough. Uh, solar power and wave power is very tricky. For solar power, you would need an immense area, so that's not feasible. Um, and diesels have a problem that they need maintenance. They cannot run autonomously without maintenance for a very long time. Um, so that kind of rules that out. Uh, so the combination of, of needing manpower to do the operations and the uh, maintenance or uh, the, the uh, ability of unmanned vessels to, to operate for a long term autonomously, that made us go for this solution. But it is something that we're still exploring because it may help us drive costs down.
Uh, there's two. First in the back, I think they were first. Um, I think it wasn't part of your presentation, but what are you uh, doing with the plastic after you uh, have collected it? And do you use analytics also for that? Um, yes and no, in order of your question. So yes, we uh, what we do is we uh, 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 we recycle the plastics as much as we can. So with the first batch of plastics, we have done a demonstration project where we recycled them in uh, sunglasses. So I'm demonstrating there. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are fully made of ocean plastics. There's just a couple of percent of, of other materials to make it stable and not smelly. That was the main challenge. Everything coming out of the ocean is not smelling nice. So if you put it on your nose, then uh, that needed to be addressed. Uh, we don't use much analytics in that field yet, but that's maybe a, a thing that we can explore and that, that could be very interesting to do. But the main thing is that we want to responsibly recycle it and transform it into durable products that don't end up in the ocean again, um, because we would like to put ourselves out of business. You also had a question. Yes, uh, I was wondering, what are you doing with the plastic that sinks? Uh, nothing yet. There is very little information about that. So what we're doing is that our group of scientists is trying to get information and get data on what happens there. Uh, in river mass, that's a little bit easier because there it's easy to measure relatively. Um, out in the ocean in the garbage patch, it's very difficult because in the area, it's about four to five kilometers deep. Yeah. So what happens down there is uh, well, a, a bit of a mystery so far, but we're trying to get the data and then well, based on that, we decide uh, if it's necessary, wise to do something and then how. What do you conjecture with regard to the oceans itself? I can imagine in, in, in the river, yeah. uh, it's clear yeah. because it immediately sinks, but I can imagine in the middle of the ocean, there will not be much. Uh, that's, that's hard to predict because what happens is the plastic is not going away, but it is, um, um, what is it? It's fragmenting. Yeah. So that's how microplastics uh, uh, come in the ocean, right? And at some point, they become so small that if there is a very little bit of, of organic material growing on it, it sinks. Yeah. Uh, so that's what's happening. So we see that in the water column, there is microplastics. Uh, the majority is still at, at floating, as we can see. But it could also be that the majority is already in the bottom, and that's what we don't know yet. So we expect there's something, but, but how much is very uncertain. And uh, with respect to the fishing industry, is there any education also put into that, that they know and they are uh, aware that it's, they yeah. are contributing to this? And also, yeah. is there any possibility that uh, commercial vessels also help out in collecting? Yeah. That they are passing by anyway. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, the fishing, yes. That's an, there's an increasing awareness in the fishing industry, uh, but mostly in the Western world. Uh, uh, there is more on, it's higher on the agenda for, I think, logical reasons. Um, but that's something that needs to be addressed, especially now we know that such a big share of plastics is coming from the fishing industry. Um, so that's something I think that still needs, uh, that still deserves a lot of attention and, and some smart ways of solving. Um, and sorry, your second question? The commercial vessels. Right. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so in the garbage patch, there is very little uh, vessel activity. So that is tricky. Also, it is something that uh, doing an operation like this, you can't do with a container vessel or a tanker. So you need mostly specified vessels for that. But it's something that's it, it's sort of in the back of our minds that if we can come up with something that they can do, um, that would be nice. And you see some initiatives that, for instance, vessels take in cooling water and ballast water, that they filter that for microplastics. So there are initiatives like that, but that's still on a very small scale. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. How do you avoid that you also catch fishes and other animals? Yeah, well, that's something that we very closely monitor and we're still learning there. But what the, the main thing is that we are going very slowly. Uh, so a fishing operation is much faster. We sail at one and a half knots. That's two to three kilometers an hour. Uh, and that makes that, that we see fish interacting with the system. They're curious. Sometimes they, they even go into that, that central retention zone. Um, and then they swim back out because they can swim way faster than that. And also we have made escapeways in that area where they can go out and, also, and uh, we put deterrence there. So there's noise, there's lights that the animals don't like. Um, and we very thoroughly scan every catch that we get to make sure that we have hardly any impact on marine life. We have a question from online. Okay. So 
uh, can you share a bit more about the optimization model itself? Like what objectives were maximized or minimized and how were, like what data was used to uh, model the capacity and route? Right, so for the hotspots, I guess that yes. is, yeah. So the, the objective for this one is maximizing that encounter density. So uh, we have the, the average density per area in the garbage patch is, is not constant. So what we, we say every, like the density that's crossing this line, so, so the mouth of the system, if you like, that we monitor. Um, and then we maximize the density or the, the mass of plastic per unit of time that we're getting in there. Um, and the other one was the constraints, right? There, yeah, so that is we have constraints on, well, span and speed, that's sort of a given. Uh, and then we have constraints that are mostly operational, like the turning rate of the system. Um, that's, I think, the most the most important one. Um, and the next step is the that uncertainty, right? So if you have that map of plastics that it could have been shifted, it, uh, the time could have been shifted. Um, we're trying to co to collect data as we go. We are working on live data, so we're putting cameras on the vessels to live uh, measure the density of plastics, but it's hard to to detect. So we are developing AI to do that. Um, and in that way, uh, see how we can maximize that encounter density. Maybe one last one from online. Uh, why not make uh, more systems rather than increasing the existing ships? Like what are the yeah. things that we consider? Yeah, well, we are, we're doing both. We One system is not enough, but uh, we, we now have one, well, because it is the starting system and we want to maximize the performance that we get out of that system first. Um, all the cost or almost all the cost for this is in those vessels, right? So operating vessels is a very expensive thing to do. So we think it makes most sense to maximize the amount of plastics that we can get out of that uh, by making that system as big as we can. So that's also something that we did with the, the work that analytics is doing in modeling those fleet operations and seeing how with bigger systems uh, or, or, or uh, 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 more smaller systems or less bigger system, which is more efficient. And there, the less bigger systems is a very clear winner because of that reason. But we will need more than one. I think that we're all the way in the back, and then I, then I come to you. So you were holding your hand. Yes, uh, so I had a question. You mentioned that the airplane was collecting data. Now you mentioned cameras maybe in front of the, in the vessels. Yeah. You thought about uh, or are you utilizing satellite imagery to yeah. detect this? Yeah, we're doing that too, but there's two uh, challenges with that, and that is you can only spot the biggest pieces of plastics, that's because of resol resolution, um, which is okay, and we're using that data sort of as a uh, um, uh, validation or a partial validation of our models. Uh, the other thing is that it's very expensive. Uh, there is not that many satellites going over the middle of the ocean. Uh, we, we did a collaboration a couple of years ago where we could get, there was a satellite passing once a day. And then we had that free floating passive system. So our had computational modeling was predicting where it was floating and then giving a target. I think it was eight hours in advance. And then there they were taking the shot. And I remember him the first time being very angry because he only had half the system in the frame. I was super impressed that he had it at, at all. <laughs> um, so that was something, uh, but that's that's another challenge. It's very expensive. It's like uh, I think it's two to three thousand euros one photo. So uh, it could be useful, but then um, uh, I think only as sort of a every now and then a validation should not continuously. Maybe that. the fish bill is getting cheaper each day. Yeah, and yeah. We are keeping we are tracking the progress there, and it, it may become available and uh, uh, well become more useful and more applicable to us and then we will definitely explore that. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned two numbers, the, the the cost per kilo, 25 euros, and you mentioned the economical damage on the other side, 14 billion yearly. Yeah. Um, would that be related to and maybe would there be a break-even point for those costs? Um, that's that's very hard because that 14 billion is worth worldwide. So there is no specific data for the plastics that are in the ocean. Uh, we're trying to get that, but that's a, that's a tricky thing. Um, on the other hand, the cost of our complete project, if we can remove 120,000 tons from this area, uh, because there's 100,000 now, but they're still in flow, so that 90% is about 120,000 tons. At 10 euros a kilo, that would total to 1.2 billion. Um, for the total project, and that 14 billion is yearly. So every year there's another 14 billion. So in that sense, it's a lot of money, but a small fraction of that cost. Uh, but getting a very direct relation is something that we're trying to get, but it's very tricky to do. Okay, thank you. 
any other questions left? Well, thanks a lot. It was yeah. really interesting. Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce the next one. Thank you.